He's on MP3. That's great. Well, first of all, I want to know where the faculty are so I won't look at them. Are they? <laughs> oh, they're over there. All right, I'm going to focus here. Normally, they're up here facing, you know, the speaker, which is always intimidating. I'm also pleased to find out what a chancellor is. <laughs> I have a very bright grandson who said to me not long ago, Bubba, isn't a chan wasn't Hitler a chancellor? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, it's great to be back with all of you and you in the sleeping porch over there. Great to have you a part of this chapel. This is a nice substitute place to gather and to worship and to be instructed. Well, today, you thought about it? 12 years ago, this morning, we were as quiet in the chapel as we are right now. We were shocked. Uh, our, our whole world changed and would never be the same again because of uh, savages who, in a cowardly manner, killed over 3,000 of our wonderful citizens and friends from around the world. And we're still chasing them down. We're still dealing with it. And it reminds me of a comment that I have made before and will make again today. There are two great days in everybody's life. First is the day that we're born, uh, and, and second is the day we realize why. George W. Bush was born in July of 1946. He realized why on 9-11, 2001. Each one of you has a birthday. It's a physical date. You can... You can celebrate it every year, and each year as you get a year older, you realize the grace of God that's been at work in your life. I just ran into Bill Lawrence over here, and he and I go back to those early days at the school, and, and we talked about his years at the, in the row houses in Philadelphia where, where he was born and raised. And, and he and I both said, can you believe what God has done over the years. And we just had a sudden moment when we realized why we had been born. I got a list of other examples. David was born to lead Israel as its greatest king. They still have the flag that represents that symbol, of the sign of David. They still call the city, the city of David. That's why he was born. Mozart, Bach, Beethoven, they, we, we can date them in their birthday, but they were born to compose timeless, ageless music that would be played through our generation and in generations to come. Michelangelo was born to sculpt and to paint. Henry Ford, born to develop the whole idea of a motorized vehicle that would be built and, and uh, duplicated over and over and over again. To this day, cars bear his name. You too were born, but many of you don't yet realize why. It's not an... It's, it's, it's not a criticism, it's not an insult, it, it's just a fact. You've yet to realize why you've been brought onto this earth. You, you will be, in the years to come, amazed when you discover why. Right now, you can't even imagine it. Oh, you have dreams, you have great hopes. I certainly hope you do. You have desires that have driven you and fueled your reason for coming to be a part of the school and to train under these fine women and men who teach you. 
and to be taught by the Lord in many ways apart from the curriculum and, uh, and the books and the schedule of the school. The, the Scottish people have a great saying, many things are better felt than telt. You'll feel them. And, and I urge you, stay, stay here. Don't be tempted to cut it short and leave. Stay at it. Work hard at it. You have no idea how it will pay off in the years to come. There's a day that passes I don't give God thanks for the privilege of living in an era when there have been faculty members that built into my life. Howie Hendricks was born to teach. Uh, how often he must have said to himself, for this I was born. And we who sat in his classroom were just spellbound by his ability to communicate truth. And you who still have the privilege of learning the life of Christ under a man whose life is about to leave him, what a privilege it is. You'll remember it the rest of your years. Now then, with all of that as a backdrop, we're going to look into a life who was not only brought onto this uh, earth by parents who named him Help. We know him as Ezra, but he was brought to uh, uh, be a part of one of the most significant events at that time and perhaps in all the ancient days of Israel. Ezra. He appears first in the seventh chapter of the book that bears his name. I hope you brought your Bible with you. Uh, and uh, as he emerges, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it's rather insignificant. We read, there was a man named Ezra. It isn't long before we read that he was a scribe. That's why. That's part of the reason he was born. Verse 6 tells us that this Ezra was a scribe. A little later in the chapter, verse 12 tells us he was the priest. So scribe, a man of words, a man of scholarly ability in the text of Scripture, having gifts and having training so that he could take God's word, the Torah, the, the words of, uh, uh, of the prophets and, and those who wrote the Psalms and help his people understand them. What a calling. That's, that's part of the why of our being born. We were called to do something. Our calling is part of what motivates us to do what we do from one year to the next. Every one of these teachers called to serve Christ, building into your lives and mine over the years. What a, what a reason to exist. An eternal calling. Ezra's was to be a scribe. And to be a priest, a scribe, a man of the word, priest, a man of worship. And then when the king sends him on his way to go back to the land from which they had been separated for years, altogether 70 long years under captivity, the king says to Ezra that he is to He's to help manage the people and give them order and direction for their lives. And so he is, he's to carry out that function as well. He has a threefold purpose as Ezra comes on the scene. Before I go any further, uh, let me add that uh, you, are, you, you are the future of Christendom. You will fill pulpits that are not now filled by you, obviously, but someday will be. 
You will start churches. You will evangelize areas. You will serve in sacrificial ways in a language you don't now know, which you will learn. And you'll be involved in the lives of others as you, in the words of the vernacular of our day, become a missionary. You, you don't know that right now. I remember uh, attending a, a panel discussion when I was a student uh, one, uh, one evening, they, had, they put several faculty members in before us. One was Zane Hodges. A number of you know of Zane. Many of us knew him and studied under him. I thought his answer was great. When uh, the question put to everyone on the panel was, oh, why didn't you go to the mission field? It wasn't insulting. It was a question for the purpose of helping everybody understand that not everybody is called there. Zane's answer was great. Who said I didn't go to the mission field? I have a mission field uh, of, of hundreds of students through my lifetime, ultimately thousands. These are all missionaries. So in a broader sense, we're all engaged in touching lives. But some of you will do this in places right now you've never been. Places that are hard to pronounce, languages that are difficult to learn, and you'll perfect them. My brother had no idea when God was touching his life that he would spend 32 years in Buenos Aires as a, as a missionary to the Argentinians. Learn the language so well, I've had Argentinians tell me we couldn't even detect an American accent. Isn't that a funny line? An American accent. Uh, we have Argentinian, but they have, they said we couldn't even tell he had learned the language so well. That's one of you, or more than one of you. And, and uh, before you think you know what it is, let me guard you against marking it off, saying it's not going to be me. Uh, I, I understand. I, I, I often would say that when I was a student, so don't do what I did. Uh, get, get past that. What a, what a dumb thing to say. Yeah, we're, you know, we are, I, I said, I'll never minister in three places. I remember telling my wife this, and she sat through that lecture several times. I'm never going to be in Texas, never going to be in New England, and definitely never going to be in California. <laughs> the only three places I've ever ministered is in Texas and New England and California. You, you have no idea. You priests, you scribes, you leaders, where you will serve. Some of you will do a grand work of evangelism, and, and you will do it on campuses, perhaps. Or, or maybe you will be engaged in it among, in, in, in the sports industry. Lord knows they, they need Jesus, and you, you, may be, you, you, you may be one of them. Not athlete, but you may be one of them that helps them get over it. <laughs> That's great. You will have trained here to do your work there. Now let me say a special word to a group of you I really want to focus on. Many of you will become pastors. You will become pastors. Shepherds of flocks. Pastor teachers. You will have congregations that will fall in love with you. N not all of them, but m many of them will, <laughs> will love the, what, what you're doing and, and that you're there for them and with them. And they'll tell you secrets they'll tell no one else. And they'll, they'll rely on you to, to hold up during uh, horrendous times when your own life is under the gun. I speak to you today and I got an older daughter in the hospital. You wouldn't have known that if I hadn't told you. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not free to cancel the chapel because I've got an older daughter in the hospital as they do uh, all kind of exploratory stuff to see what's made her so sick. We don't know. Uh, but my calling requires me today to be here. I was there at 6 o'clock this morning, and I was there at 8 o'clock last night with my wife. But today I'm away from her. So part of me is there, but my presence is here. I say that only because that welcome to ministry. You will forever be pulled in, in ways that, that will 
will be uh, horrendous for you. You'll make it. Part of the reason you'll make it is because you see it modeled in these, chapel, in, in these uh, faculty members and in fellow students. Uh, one of my teachers was Bruce Walke. Oh, that was, that was fun. Uh, we had Walke right after he was back from Harvard. They had asked him to stay as a teacher, and he said, no, I'm called to this little school in Dallas. And once he came back, I thought, why didn't he stay and <laughs> touch the lives of the Harvard students? Uh, there. Tough. Uh, I, I, I was never a great Hebrew scholar, but to this day, I read from the Hebrew text. Uh, no, no week passes when I'm in an Old Testament passage that I don't consult the original text. How dare I go through these years at this school and learn how to do it and then stop doing it? Uh, our congregation loves the color of the original languages and, and, and the Greek text as well. And you who are, who are involved in that, uh, stay at it. You are at the place where you have a chance to learn how to read the text and study the text and ultimately apply the text in a meaningful way so that you become known. I'm talking now to you pastors. You'll become known as the expositor in the community. And that's fast leaving the language of, of Christians today. Be grateful for the fact that you can be an expositor of the word of God. Look at verse 10 of chapter 7. This is our, our friend Ezra. Verse, verse uh, 9 ends, the gracious hand of his God was on him. Why? Verse 10 tells us why. Because Ezra had determined, don't go any further. He had set his heart. He had made a commitment. You've done that. I hope you've done that. When you set aside your responsibilities back home and you and your partner in life, if you are married, or you alone, if you came as a single, you came because you have set your heart. You have determined in this calling, the reason you were born, you have determined that you will pursue this study. This will be your one and only chance now, you can return to study, I realize that, but in no other time can you go through a course like this that will be more meaningful for you. He determined that he would study and obey the law of the Lord and teach it. Look at those three objectives. To study, to obey, to teach. That's a pretty good order to follow. Right now, you are in the study phase. Don't get antsy. All the time I was at seminary, during my four years here, there were guys all around me that were er, urging the class to uh, get up and get out and get, get beyond it. Get beyond what? It's the best time of your life to do your studies. Get serious about your studies. You have the, these minds to guide you. You have the library uh, packed with great uh, literature to help you in your study. You cultivate your own library. And, and, and you take that with you. I, uh, we, when we built our home in, uh, uh, out in Frisco, we had the pleasure of uh, finally having all my books under one roof. I'd never had that before. I'd always had a number of them at the church, and uh, some of them I just never were able, was able to unpack, and, and then a number of them we had in our, our shelves at home. And now we have, I, I not only have a study, I have a library. I walk through a little hallway to get to the library, and I just go in there, and I just, you know, what happens to women when they walk in Nordstrom's? This happens to me when I walk into my library. I get chills up my back. It's so good to be with those books. It's wonderful. 
My wife walks into North Street, she just says, just stop, let's just listen to the piano. I said, good, that's all we're gonna do here, I'll be really a happy guy. <laughs> and it, it never stops there, okay. Your books, okay? Your world is opening up to a, a body of literature you didn't even know existed. And this is your chance, part of your study. Don't cut it short. Spend some of your money on works that will outlive and outlast you. And they were there before you came along. Invaluable. You'll pick up techniques you'll never get anywhere else. Ezra determined he would study. And then he wanted to make certain in the study that it would impact his own life. That's a very valuable principle. That'll hold you in great stead with your congregation. They will love to know that it applies to you just as it does to them. I've had people say, how do you know what to preach on? And my answer is often, I preach on something I need to hear and I'll let you listen in. Because it always applies to something I need to have in my own life. It was Ezra's commitment. He determined that he would study God's word for the purpose of doing it. Doing it. He wasn't become simply a, 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 a distant, uh, uh, absent-minded scholar, if you will. He would take the truth that he was learning and it would become a part of his system, thinking, life, habits. He would be transformed by the truth. Something is wrong if you leave this school without that transformation. You've either not taken it seriously, not applied yourself to it as you should, or you've missed something major along the way. So I urge you to uh, set aside the complaining. It's hard. For what it's worth, it's supposed to be hard. Ministry is hard. And because it's tough, you've developed the habit of, of, of pressing through it. Uh, we lost two babies here. Uh, that, that's tough to go through that. Uh, but you go on. We had an accident in our hometown in Houston where a drunk hit us and totaled our car. And uh, we missed the seating of the seniors. One of the few times that you get applause at this joint. And I didn't, I, I didn't even get, get the seating of the seniors because they were taking care of our car stuff down there. Broke our son's jaw. We didn't quit. You don't quit because of that. Life's full of broken jaws and drunk drivers and heartbreaking moments and unexpected tragedies and accidents, disappointments. When you study to do the work as you are getting into the word, you, it, it begins to transform you. You're not untouched by it, it, it but, but you're not sidelined. You don't throw a pity party every month though it's hard, and ultimately to teach. <laughs> Is there any greater joy for you who teach, you who preach? Is there any greater joy than knowing God used your mouthpiece, your throat, your lips, your tongue to communicate truth that people live by? Oh, man. It's a calling like no other. It's better than it would ever be if you were an attorney. Or as important as a physician is who came in late last night to begin the diagnosis of our daughter. And I gave God thanks for a gastroenterologist whom I'd never met before. But he knew the right questions. And he was on duty. And he was willing to take time for our daughter. Of a great calling. But he's not teaching multitudes like you will. He may someday do academic medicine, or she may, and be in teaching the, the students, but you're going to be engaged in touching the lives of those who are spiritually ignorant, starving. There's a famine in the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but for hearing the word of God. I'll tell you, everywhere I go, I sense the famine, and it's greater, it seems, now than ever. People are more ignorant of Scripture than I've ever known them to be. And uh, 
all the more reason for us to be committed to teaching the decrees and the regulations to the people that God calls us to. And who knows who, those who he'll call you to, to minister to. So we're clear on that. Ezra was born and Ezra had a reason to be born. This is all part of that determining to give himself to the assignment of preparation. That's where you are. Invaluable, invaluable time for you. I'm thrilled for you that you're able to be here and to do this. All the, all the challenges notwithstanding. Now go to Nehemiah 8. Okay. Now we're going to go to the place where Ezra must have looked up into the heavens and said, For this I was born. Oh, time has passed. A number of things I'll not get into. But for the sake of our time together, I want you to observe that they've gathered at the square, chapter 8 of Nehemiah. They're now in the city. He's come back home. And uh, he's with a body of people who have not been around the scrolls of the scriptures. They've been in captivity. They picked up a lifestyle of the captivity. Quite likely began to live like those who had taken them captive. So they're now at the city square. And there is an assembly that meets at the water gate, according to uh, this uh, first verse. And they ask Ezra, look at this, they ask Ezra the scribe, of course. Why? He's qualified. He had, by the way, he had no campaign manager. He, he wasn't out promoting his stuff. You don't have to do that. You, 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 don't, you don't have to write letters of reference for yourself. Have somebody else sign them. You don't have to do that. You'll be called. God knows where you are. In, in some... In some remarkable way, he'll reach into the ranks and he'll say, okay, now you. Now you. It's your time at the city square. So they come and they're just inside that gate from early morning until noon. He read aloud to everyone who could understand, according to this uh, third verse. Uh, second verse. Uh, third verse. <laughs> uh, six hours. Now, uh, hold on. You, you have a heart, okay? Uh, just because he read six hours doesn't mean that you put your congregation through that. Because <laughs> it's a whole different setting. The point is, they took it seriously. How do I know? Because when he opened the scroll, they stood up. Look at it. Ezra the priest, verse uh, 2, brought the book of the law before the assembly, which included the men and women and all the children old enough to understand. He faced the square just inside the water gate from early morning till noon and read aloud to everyone who could understand. All the people listened uh, closely to the book of the law. And uh, as he read it to them, they have stood to their feet. What that must have been like. So here he is with the scroll. He's, a, he's knowledgeable in the scroll. You will know more about the Bible than most people in your congregation. It's not a source of pride. That's a, that's a responsibility. You will go prepared. And you will, by the grace of God, have the wisdom to conduct yourself in a way that will, be, that will help them feel the appealing nature, the magnetic nature draw of the living word of God. And, and, and he read aloud from it and all the people, everyone who could understand, listened closely to the book of the law. Now look at verse four. First reference to anything like a pulpit. Probably means more like a platform. He stood on a high wooden platform that had been made for the occasion. He had six folks on the right side and he had seven on the left. There were 13 of them. You read it here. To his right stood Mattathiah and Shema and hard name 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 and hard name. Thirteen hard names. You don't read about any of them anywhere else. But here, these Levites 
are going to work the crowd, if you will. They're going to move among the people who have gathered for what purpose? Well, the end of verse, uh, of, of verse 4, of verse 5 says, When they saw him open the book, they all rose to their feet. And they all said in a chant, Amen and Amen. They lifted their hands. They bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Why? He simply is reading from the book. I mean, this is like water to a, 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 a desert wanderer. This is, this is food for the starving. And they hear it and they realize this is eternal truth I need in my life. And, and all the people who listen closely are responding now with their words, I believe it, I believe it, I'm with you. I'm ready to take it. And so verse 8 is one of the best verses in all the Old Testament on biblical exposition. Look at it closely. Look at verse 8. They read from the book of the law. They would be the, the hard names that I did not read a moment ago. Thirteen of them. Thirteen of these people who are among the people. They, they are reading in little pockets of people among the group. The, 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 the book of the law of God. Now notice also, they clearly explained the meaning of what was being read. The Hebrew says they translated it. It's the word that means to separate or to specify. So as they're reading, they are, they are helping the, the listener understand what that phrase means uh, and, and what that word means, because it wouldn't be familiar to them. They, they've long since lost touch with the Hebrew text. So whatever their uh, language that they're at that, at that time uh, speaking, these uh, priests that work with them, are all, these Levites are also aware of. So they move from the Hebrew text, they move into the vernacular of the everyday life, and the people are like, oh, wow, oh, man, oh, this is terrific. Look at, listen to this, and look at that. And... And, and we read, they explain the meaning of what was being read. Look at the end of that verse. Helping the people understand each passage. That's your job as a pastor. As an evangelist committed to the word of God, that's your job as an evangelist. As a missionary, it is not simply about doing work on foreign fields. It is about the use of the word of God and communicating it to people who need it to live as they ought to be living. It is the uh, huh, ever unpopular and uh, resisted truth that more and more in our country are standing against. But there they were, not having heard the word, they now got the meaning, they had it explained, and they understood the passage. I want to tell you something. I've been through over 50 years in the pulpit, and I can't number the times people have said to me as they walk by, and I'm staying there visiting with them and listening to their responses and all, uh, one after another, often with tears often with tears, saying, thank you, thank you for helping me understand what this, what this means. Thank you for applying it to where I live. Thank you. And they're thanking me, of all things. But I understand. Uh, when I finish a great meal uh, and we're at a lovely place to eat, I will often say, where's the chef? Can I have a chance to say a few words to the chef? I guess not many people do that, so they think I'm going to complain. But no, uh, when I get a chance to see him, uh, I, I say to him, what a, what a delicious meal. Man, what a gift you have. This is, this is wonderful. I'll wear this meal the next five, six days. I, <laughs> I, I ate so much of it. It's wonderful food. You're the chef. Nobody else can cook like you can cook. Or very few. And, and you're called to this. This is your, 
reason for being born. <laughs> oh, man. F.B. Meyer wrote it this way. In some unlikely quarter in a shepherd's hut or an artisan's cottage, God has his prepared and appointed instrument. That's you. As yet the shaft is hidden in his quiver. This is where you are right now, in the quiver. In the shadow of his hand, but at the precise moment at which it will tell with the greatest effect, it will be produced and launched on the air. You're the arrow from the quiver. And it will land where God calls you. There you will touch lives. Nobody else in the community will touch. And unless you prepare as you must, you won't do a very good job of it. If you talk yourself out of the hard work of these years at the school, I'm going to tell you there's a, there's a consequence that follows that that you will regret the rest of your life. But if you give yourself to it, and if your partner in life is just, just as committed as you are, uh, you're, you're, you're going to discover rewards like you cannot right now imagine. John Piper wrote a book called Brothers, We Are Not Professionals. I think he's trying to get across the word not in the title here. <laughs> we are not professional. He says in the back, oh, we pastors are being killed by the professionalizing of the pastoral ministry. The mentality of the professional is not the mentality of the prophet. It is not the mentality of the slave of Christ. Professionalism has nothing to do with the essence and heart of Christian ministry. The more professional we long to be, the more spiritual death we will leave in our wake. For there is no professional childlikeness. There is no professional tenderheartedness. There is no professional panting after God. And from one of the chapters, these words emerge. The more a theologian detaches himself from the basic Hebrew and Greek text of Scripture, the more he detaches himself from the source of real theology. And real theology is the foundation of a fruitful and blessed ministry. Several things happen as the original languages fall into disuse among pastors. First, the confidence of pastors to determine the precise meaning of biblical texts. And with the confidence to interpret rigorously goes the confidence to preach powerfully. It's difficult to preach week in and week out over the whole range of God's revelation with depth and power if you are plagued with uncertainty. Amen to that. Second, the uncertainty of having to depend on differing translations, which always involve much interpretation. We tend to discourage. That will tend to discourage careful textual analysis in sermon preparation. So the preacher often contents himself with the general focus or flavor of the text, and his exposition lacks precision and clarity, which excite a congregation with the Word of God. Boring generalities are a curse in many pulpits. Sometimes it's evident in outright denunciation of exposition as pedantic and schoolish. More often, there's simply a benign neglect and an emphasis on sermonic features like order, diction, gestures, illustrations, and relevance crowds out the need for careful textual exposition. By the way, I've never had anybody critique me in my gestures. I've never had anybody critique me as it relates to sermonic style. When they're being fed, they're loving it. So quit worrying about making an impression or looking like you've got your sermon memorized. I've never memorized a sermon in my life. The only thing I memorize is the opening line and a pretty well exhausted memory at that point. And then I go, and then I go to my notes, even when I'm gonna speak here. And I've spoken here dozens of times, but I need 
what, is, what it is that the Lord said in my mind when I was preparing the message. Or I'll drift. Or I'll get all involved in what are they thinking of me right now. How smooth is my transition? <laughs> Finally, I, I'm, I'm through with this. When, when we fail to stress the use of the originals as valuable in the pastoral office, we create an eldership of professional academicians. They're sitting here on your right. Nothing wrong with that, but we limit it to them. We surrender to the seminaries essential dimensions of our responsibility as elders and pastors and overseers of the church. I'm deeply grateful for seminaries and Bible-believing, God-centered scholars. But did God really intend that the people who interpret the Bible most carefully be one step removed from the weekly ministry of the Word and the church and its pulpit? These are not men and women of the pulpit for the most part, though all of them certainly can hold their own. They're the ones I turn to when I'm not going to be at Stonebrow Church. But these are scholars. And their work is into the text deeper than most of us will ever get. But we don't, we don't relinquish the calling of a serious commitment to the Word of God to this body of 40 or 50 men and women. We can't. There's not enough of them. We need to recover our vision for the pastoral office, which embraces, if nothing else, the passion and power to understand the revelation of God. We need to pray for the day when pastors can carry their Greek texts to conferences and seminars without being greeted with one-liners. The day when the esteem of God's word and its careful exposition is so high among pastors that those who do not have the skills will humbly bless and encourage those who do and will encourage younger men to get what they never got. Oh, for the day when prayer and grammar will meet with each other with great spiritual combustion. That's a great sentence, by the way. He quotes Luther, and with it I close. Without languages, we could not have received the gospel. Languages are the scabbard that contains the word, the sword of the Spirit. They are the casket which contains the priceless jewels of antique thought. They are the vessel that holds the wine. And as the gospel says, they are the baskets in which the loaves and fishes are kept to feed the multitude. Luther said, if the languages had not made me positive as to the true meaning of the word of God, I might have still remained a chained monk engaged in quietly preaching Romish errors in the obscurity of a cloister. The Pope, the sophists, and their anti-Christian empire would have remained unshaken. In other words, he attributes the breakthrough of the, Re of the Reformation to the penetrating power of the Word of God. That's yours. Handed to you from one year to the next for you to absorb, obey, and apply. And I can tell you from experience, you will never, ever regret the privilege of being God's spokesperson. Let's bow together for prayer. Thank you, Father, for giving us a book that is in our language so that we can understand what it says and what it means and how it applies, first in our own sinful, wayward lives and then in the lives of those to whom we minister. Forgive us, our Father, for laziness, for losing the passion of our calling, for turning attention to ourselves rather than to the truth of the book. Oh, Lord, uh, I ask that you would glorify your name through these who are now studying, preparing to minister your truth. In our lives, Lord, be glorified. Be glorified. 